Welcome to the Winners and Losers Show. Hello, everybody. My name is Hank Thompson. I'm the host of the show. I'm going to be the host of the show until all the Christmas carols are uh, sung, sung up, sing them up. I was going to say uh, Christmas carolers are shoot off, and I don't mean shoot T with a T. I mean shooed with a D at the end, like shoo, go on, get, get. Oh, man. Welcome, everybody. Hello there. Welcome. Hi. Hi. It's me, Hank. Welcome to the show. It's a Christmas spectacular. We've got all kinds of stuff. we got Santa coming on a little bit later. We're going to interview him. We're going to interview uh, one of his elves who's trying to form a union. They're uh, very upset. They want uh, some rights, and those elves have no rights. Um, also, they don't handle those Arctic summers. They're, they're, they're built for the winters, but summertime is hard on them because they um, they burn easily. It's all, okay, what the fuck am I, oh, okay, well, here we go, we're starting, and uh, I just I had a memory there when I did the shoot thing, I just uh, briefly just had this flash image in my brain of, uh, as a child, my dad battling a raccoon with a broom, I, um, he, he, he held the broom like a spear and opened the door, we had like a side door to the side of the house off the kitchen, he opened up this rickety ass screen door and uh, just whipped the fucking broom at the rack, I, I, I remember watching not thinking too, you know, when you're a kid, you just start absorbing your parents' energy slash observing the world, learning boundaries, figuring shit out, being a dumb kid. And uh, I just remember seeing how fucking crazy my dad looked. <laughs> just, just, just launching this. Because, you know, you can't, you don't throw a broom at a raccoon like a spear with like a smile. I mean, I guess you could, but, you know, with, it's not a normal just relaxed activity so it makes sense that you'd get intense kind of like when you're at a circus trying to win a stuffed animal for your girl by tossing a baseball at a stack of milk jugs or some hanging paint cans actually no they throw uh, empty beer bottles at paint cans is that a is that a common i remember seeing that once at a, at a carnival circus thing i don't like those those places are obnoxious i find it just it's too much moseying and i got fuck that I could go get a ping pong ball and a bunch of goldfish and throw the ping pong balls into the goldfish bowls at Petco. Why would I go to the circus for that shit? No, I'm just joking. It's just, I just I, it, the reason I don't like circuses is because I've only ever gone um, lacking human physical contact and intimacy. Mainly, I've just been dragged along on drunken bullshit with friends. And I'm referring to part of my 20s. I think I did that once. Honestly, it was fun. It's good. Good times. I wish I liked more things. God, what a what a fucking. Um, it's not that I don't. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, so my dad beat up a raccoon with a broom. Never saw the raccoon, by the way. Just realized. Never saw the raccoon. Didn't get his side or her side of the story. Maybe there's more going on. Maybe there was he was up to something that justified my dad's animosity, such as fucking with our orange peels. Hey, hey, that's my bag of orange peels, you fucking raccoon. Um, so, good. This is how I start the show because I am... Uh, expecting some new listeners to maybe arrive people who might not have uh, encountered the show or me before and i like to give you the worst possible impression up front so that i can earn it earn it the hard way <laughs> that's how i'm doing so anyway welcome one and all welcome all the happy half hour viewers did you guys watch did you watch you should have you better watch i got another video i'm going to talk about a second here too that i want you to watch as well I made a music video, an animated music video. I didn't, I, I'll get into it. Don't worry, it's, it's fun. There's a link in the description. But I was a guest on the Happy Half Hour with Brett Ehrlich, the previous episode's guest of this show. And that's terrible English, very confusing. Brett does a show at the Young Turks called the Happy Half Hour, and they uh, they were desperate for guests. No, 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 they have no problem finding. But they, he had me on, and it was great. We did sauce. We had sauce. And uh, it, 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 fun time, man. It is so much more so much better talking and blabbing and being just a trying to be funny jag off into a camera or a microphone than video editing <laughs> and i'm not complaining i'm grateful and thrilled to uh, be a paid video editor i love it it's work i'm good at it's work i care about being good at and i'm proud to work at the young turks but man being a funny jag off so much more or so much easier it's easier it's more fun and uh i think the ultimate uh payout too not that it's about money but that you know there's probably a higher ceiling as far as what you get paid if you eventually you get to write for bill nye or some bullshit like that no i would love to write for bill nye okay, are you kidding me are you kidding me my words coming out of that guy's mouth him going welcome to the winners and bill nye show i'm your host hank thompson i'm gonna be the, the bill nye until all the hank thompsons are done okay you get the idea 
So anyway, big thanks to Brad Tug and listen to the previous episode where he was a guest. He's easy to talk to, good guy, smart guy, lots to say there, and I expect to see him back around here eventually, uh, as well as other uh, folks from the Young Turks. So. Booking is just obnoxious. <laughs> so I'm going to whine about that. Uh, but it's much easier. It'll it'll get easier, and eventually I'll get into a rhythm and and start doing stuff too. And it's 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 really fun to record. Not I mean maybe well yeah it's fun, but it, like um, it's nice to record at, at work because they have like a uh, spaces I can use. But also it's nice to just sort of stay in your brain in your work brain and do it and get it done. And then because uh, like I come home and I start seeing the couch and I look at the floor and I go oh that looks so comfortable and I go, oh look at those pillows ah oh, I got a pile of laundry oh I want to eat oh I want to lay down and moan slowly until morning but um then i do the pie I'm not saying it's bad. it's just like you know it's a you got to force myself to shift into this gear when i get going and you know what I, I do i just do because i'm a pro i mean i meant to say i'm a pro i'm, I'm a bro <laughs> no I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. okay all right well what a time oh yeah more more shit to promote <laughs> It's not shit, by the So uh, here, this is a thing I want you to do. I um, uh, animated, edited, I directed, I suppose, would also be the right word, sort of, uh, a music video for um, a guy, for a band called Ring Out, for my friend Dan, who uh, found me through Suck Professor. I guess he was a viewer or something, and he uh, he's a fella, a nice guy. Uh, he has a band, and, uh, you know, these bands, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, everybody has a band. <laughs> Big deal. You know who has bands? British people fucking have bands. Big deal. Big fuck. No, no, no. But he had a band, and he's like, I, I'm, we're, we're, we have this idea for an animated thing. We, he knew a couple artists. Uh, they live in uh, Minnesota or some shit. And, uh, you know, this is according to him, because we spoke on the phone a few times, and a uh, really good dude. But he said I was going to go local, but then I realized, hey, my, my favorite YouTube channel, that's in my words, not his, is that guy Hank, and he seems to be an editor, animator guy. Let me see if he's interested. And I was, because I was f- desperate. And actually, he was a nice dude, and it was a challenge, and um, I'm very proud of it, by the way. I just want to say that. It, it turned out great. I put in tons of hours. I maxed out what he his budget to pay me. <laughs> but then I was even like, I can't put this out shitty, and I'm I, I just just pay me your max, and I'll just make this fucking thing good. All right, That's, I'm not gonna put out a, give you a shitty video. Um, it was very fair. I was thrilled to do it. It's really cool to get paid for shit like that. And um, God, I quit swearing does so much, but uh, I'd like you to watch it. Please watch it and promote it if you, or you know, share it if you like it. And let me let me give the ultimate compliment. It's not gonna sound like one, but it is. Trust me. I edited this thing, which means I listened to this song. Uh, hundreds of times, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 89 times or probably 417. I don't know. It's hard. You lose it just over and over and over and little bits and little pieces of it, timing it all out, putting it all together. I did a lot of 3D. Uh, at, 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 I used 2D artwork. I converted these photos of drawings into puppets uh, with articulated arms. And I said I, I did some of my own artwork. I, I drew the shark. I drew the clouds. So this is so when you watch it, you'll see this stuff. Uh, I drew some of the uh, the waves. There's a whole wave sequence with this, but they drew these really cool drawings. These uh, pencil line drawings, uh, or maybe pen, but you know, like line white on black drawings. And uh, there's a there's a pirate ship. There's a one of those um, old timey uh, crank railroad cart thingies in it. <laughs> we got one of those. That also it, it's so it's it's a fun, playful thing, and uh, a lot of work. Uh, you know, you get. By the end of these projects, you, I think the trick to finishing stuff is to like, well, first of all, some guy was paying me, so I had to. But get so much, get like so close to being done that if you don't finish it, you're just it's just going to eat away at you. Because you can quit at like 20% done, and uh, that's just another thing I didn't really fucking feel good about. But like get to like 60, 70, 80%, and then it starts to become inevitable. Or at least that's how I so, sort of operate. Not sure why I'm mentioning that, but... Uh, really good, uh, good. I'm thrilled with the result. And here's the compliment. I have listened to that song so many goddamn times. I don't hate it. I don't hate the song. Even because you end up hating everything you edit when you're an editor. <laughs> you just like, you just want to be done with it. It's like having a kid who won't stop drooling. It's like, all right, stop. How much more is there? Jesus. I'm going to quit giving you water. Water being the primary ingredient in drool. What's the other ingredient? Oh my God. 
Huh. Something to ask Jeeves. Um, so, anyway, I, it's a good song. It's like kind of a, a rock, rocky pop. I don't know how to describe music, but it's a good song. It's a good song. Ring Out is the name of the band. Show them some love. Tell them Hank sent you. And uh, it got, I guess it got written up in their local newspaper. Uh, you know, bands, local Minnesota bands, don't always have a fucking Hollywood editor giving them uh, his best go. So uh, the guy written up, I guess. It's pretty cool. It, it's a cool video. I, ho- I, th- I hope you agree. Um, like everything, when I watch it, I just see nothing but the mistakes and the flaws. <laughs> no, no, that's not true at all. I did that because that's how you do it. You you do eighteen different final exports because every single one of them you go. Oh, that. Oh, I didn't. Oh, that key frame I can tell is off because it doesn't actually finish. It's uh, it's uh, Ken Burns. Um, not that this is all Ken Burns action. All Ken Burns. By the way, there's nothing fucking fancy about what Ken Burns does. Ken Burns puts those pictures on his uh, videos, <laughs> like he calls them. You think he calls them videos? Oh, I've got to go make another clip. Uh, and uh, but um. It's just a a keyframe at the very opening frame and a keyframe at the very final frame at a certain position slash uh, scale. So it's not, come on, let's not, it adds a lot. And he does, you do make a choice. Like you pick your final moment and you're starting, your finishing point, your starting point. And like with Civil War, I want to finish on this uh, grainy old white guy's face who hasn't smiled in 40 years. Because nobody smiled uh, before 1974 when humor was invented. Laughing, suck it to me. <laughs> the fuck. Um, so, check out "Ring Out" the the, the video uh, that I made. I, I, the song is called uh, "Ferd Ferdin for a long. I don't I don't know. See, I don't I don't know. Didn't look at the file. What what, what am I nuts? So, um, I'm proud of it, and I I want to share it with you. So please please give it a look. Uh, also follow Brett Ehrlich on uh, Twitter. I got, I don't, that's something I had written down. <laughs> um, awesome. So. Wow, man! Let's get into some stories here. Uh, we got I'm going to talk about homelessness a bit. Uh, there's uh, Trump is uh, dis- dissolving his charity. That's another thing I'm going to get into, um, as well as the uh, Schumer, Pelosi, Mike Pence, and Trump. Um, I don't know if you'd call that a meeting. Weird performative uh, dipshit fest that they had last week. Um, they uh, so we got audio from that. Uh, yeah, so those are, those are the kind of things we're aiming for here. If I, uh, you know, but what's going to really happen is we'll get to one and a half of those, and I'm going to ramble around and just go, you know, trip over my own uh, distractions. So that's uh, that's okay though. That's what we do here at the at the Winners and Losers Show. I was going to ramble about coffee at the office. I'm. Uh, it's amazing how quickly you turn into just a dumbass who says stupid things about coffee. That's already happened to me. So it, it gets in you. This this office culture stuff. Where you start to worship your the coffee and you get upset when it doesn't work. Not that that's really been a problem, but, you know, it's weird. I always thought I was cooler than that. Turns out, just needed a job. Find out how not cool I am. I guess when you're an isolated weirdo who spends most of his time alone, uh, you, you start to believe you're cool. <laughs> I wish that was true. That's the opposite, the opposite of that. Um, so... All right. Anyway, fuck it. Coffee's fun. We all are all addicted to coffee. Smart business model is uh, be in the uh, addiction business. Anything people get addicted to is good business. Coffee, cigarettes, alcohol, uh, drugs, sex, rock and roll. You know, that's why Elvis, he got into all five of those. So good for you, Elvis. Um, Anyway, we got some news stories to talk about. There's a David Schwimmer lookalike. This is the top story. (laughs) This guy looks like David Schwimmer, and a British judge wants to arrest him. And there's a photo of a security, a granny security, and then one of David Schwimmer, and uh, I think it's him. I think we should be on the lookout for David Schwimmer. So be prepared, everybody. He, he He's probably armed, and he's certainly not dangerous, because he's armed with a stack of Friends DVDs. And, um, you know, you should listen to him. They're 720p, though, because that was way back at the beginning of DVDs, and the menu barely works. You, one button on your remote will make it move around, and, but eventually it'll just start playing automatically somehow. So, David Schwimmer lookalike. Why the hell did that get into this show? Get out of here, David Schwimmer lookalike. All right, check that one off the list. And uh, next thing, um, oh, this isn't even written, but um, greeting card. It's Christmas. So just a quick reminder, send your cards. If you're not going home or, you know, you got cards to send, you want them to show up before Christmas, although it's probably a little late, send them away. Just get them in the mail. I did that today. I had to go to the post office. I, I feel like I deserve more credit 
Like I wanted to open up all the the cards I was sending and write in there. You know, I had to go to the post office for the shit. I had to f- no, but uh, I I don't. I have strong feelings about greeting cards. I think they're a scam. I think it's absurd that we are expected to send uh, someone uh, we love a profitable piece of cardboard that someone drew or thought of and wrote some dumb words. And um, but uh, I get you know you're supposed to express affection and stuff. I just find it impersonal, and uh, I don't like the that it seems necessary and it's just a what's the markup on those things how much does it cost to print a card and a little folding envelope huh huh answer me 25 cents maybe doubtful selling it for 3.99 for the cheap ones get out of here you want a pop-up it's going to be 6.99 you want something that sinks 7.99 what a waste just more trash greeting cards are good for one thing and one thing only the opposite of trash cash what if i thought that opposite meant rhyming like i didn't understand what the word means <laughs> yeah it's like the opposite of sports jorts it's gonna let the awkwardness sit there for a little while on that one um but uh, greeting cards are bullshit but I, I like i don't think i'm not saying expressing heartfelt affection or even just uh non heart you know whatever hey hope you're uh not nope your cancer's getting easier you know like hey get well soon uh, sorry you had a bad car accident that sucks or whatever it's you know it's not the th- it, it, it's the la- okay okay here here's what it is here's what it is i'm not railing against the thought it's the i feel like the card detracts from the thought because the card is some corporation inserting itself into this exchange therefore blank cards blank story that's the uh, plot of the movie blank man starring um the weigh-in guy <laughs> what the fuck uh, keenan not keenan shit the uh, older one but anyway you know the, it's a good movie blank man um I, I totally got robbed that year for the best picture by the way uh so greeting cards do a blank and write a note just write it in there people love a handwritten note especially in this era it used to be that was the only way you had to talk to somebody it took 18 months to have a conversation now we're all just texting each other pictures of eggplants and squirting whales and shit like that just to say I'm horny. And now uh, we, we know, no one gets letters anymore. By the way, a real letter, like just a written up thing. Ooh, man. That is how you know you're into somebody. Don't do that until the fourth date. All right, fellas? But write a little note in your card, or you could do what I do. I draw a picture of me. Go to my Instagram if you want. Link in the description. This is not just so I could promote that. I don't expect... But I... I, uh, I I take photos of the drawings I do and I post them because I'm trying to monetize the affection I have for my family. Why the fuck should uh, they be the only ones that see this stuff? You know, I got to get something out of this too. No, I joke. I joke. It's a, it's an exchange. It's family. It's fine. But I just think that the um, greeting card thing is way too expensive. So here's a couple tips. First, you already heard the first one. Use blank ones and draw or write something. People love that shit. And uh, the other one is um, dollar store. I mentioned this on the My Suck Professor show on uh, on our Patreon podcast, but this needs to reach a larger audience. In my poverty-stricken last couple of years, I wound up at the dollar store for stuff, and uh, I discovered a little late, you know, I could have saved myself millions of dollars over the years buying fucking cards at Target. I should have put the fucking in front of Target there. That would have been more impactful. But the dollar store, good cards. Maybe not as extensive a selection, but what do you need? Birthday from grandma for i mean for grandma for you know for him for her blah 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 hey you're 80 oh gross oh you're 82 nice keep going 90 wow that's uh oh 100 holy shit still going wow 110 that's adorable wow 120 i'm afraid to touch you you look like you'll turn into dust you old skeleton and uh but dollar store cheap greeting cards i don't know what the prices are but they're way less than target so uh get them at the dollar store. And also, while you're there, buy a little pack of sandpaper. I bought sandpaper from the dollar store. Horrible. Horrible sandpaper. Terrible. Just awful. Just fucking terrible. Surprised it had any glue. Might as well have just been a bag of sand and some paper. And I would have thrown it on the roof with all the raccoon carcasses. All right. So let's get into uh, this next story here. Um, Stephen Miller. Now, if you guys don't know who this is, he is Donald Trump's... Goebbels? Is that the right Nazi analogy? <laughs> He's this guy. He's like 34 years old. Prematurely bald. 
which is partially what we're talking about today. His head is one of his main features. People like to point it out. Uh, but this guy's a, a, a horrible... He's like comes from this alt right swamp. He's like this. Dis- I don't. I'm not even sure if that's an accurate way of describing him. Uh, he's nefarious. He's the one behind all the anti immigration stuff. And not that Trump isn't as well, but this guy is the main driver of that. I know he writes a bunch of speeches and shit, and he weighs in on this t- thing. And some for some reason, he ends up on the news fairly. No, I wouldn't say regularly because he tends to not do really well, although in Trump world, he, people probably think he does great. He sticks to his points. He does speak English. I mean, it's not like he's up there, uh, you know, um, poking, uh, you know, pulling bloody tissues out of his nose. By the way, I had a bloody nose. And then uh, at work. No, 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 that's not what happened. I bit my lip really hard. Anyway, whatever. OK, I had bloody tissues at work and I didn't want to just throw them away. I didn't bite. I was picking my lip and it started bleeding. That's just, I mean, come on. Bite. Who bites their lips so hard they bleed when you're not eating or orgasming? And by the way, if that's how how you orgasm, you bite your lips so hard. Meh, all right, high five. <laughs> um, but I had bloody tissue. Okay, so anyway, Stephen Miller is just a horrible person. He's he's uh, his youth makes him more sinister. His baldness makes him evil. Uh, not that baldness is a source of evil, but uh, it is commonly expressed and presented and demonstrated, uh, that's not the right word, uh, in popular culture is that baldness is a trait associated with villains. I noticed this. I used to have a bit about this. It was sort of a seed of a bit where I would just name all of them, but I never bothered doing the work of memorizing. Because there's, there, there's like 50 or so. I mean, it, you could easily make it one of those like run-on kind of comedy things where it's just sort of a, the joke is making a point about the baldness too, but as well as then you just are proving that you memorize a whole bunch of stuff, which can be kind of funny if you really push it and, you know, whatever. I don't know. I never really totally fleshed out the bit. But there is an idea behind that because baldness is associated with evil. I have one or bad guys like Lex Luthor or like all kinds of cartoons of the bald guy is a bad guy. And there's examples of positive bald people like The Last Airbender, like me. I often refer to The Last Airbender and myself in the same sentence because why not? Fuck it. And, uh... I, I played a role in a web series for a guy a while back, and um, they were nice. They were real, real professional, but my character's name was Bald Villain. I was a member of a tribe, like it was they—they they were like a steampunk enthusiast or something, and so they were doing sort of like an adventure series or I, I don't know. And <laughs> but they had decided their like gang of bad guys that constantly that they fought against, not just the gang who. Um, like they fight, but like the, the, the top sort of, you know, the Joker, so to speak, you know, like the top level that would like sort of direct all the, uh, you know, nefarious activities of other gangs. Not quite, but you know what I mean? Like they were the primary evil force that sort of, uh, you know, drove it all kind of like, um, Paul Ryan. Um, but they uh, they were all bald. Their whole thing was they were just this group of bald dudes, and they lived in like some weird, you know, sort of. It's it's intentionally uh, cheeky the the idea, the concept. Uh, you know, going back to like Flash Gordon and those old adventure days with the bald, the evil bald guy. And so anyway, I played a guy named uh, Bald Villain, <laughs> and uh, not the primary. I kind of wanted that, but they had a good act. They had a dude that really. I mean, I can act in a pinch. I'm not the worst guy. You know what I mean? I I'll I'll get it done. But uh, you're not uh, you're not you're not you're not rubbing one out to it later. So let's say the, they got this other guy, and he was good. He's older too. He had kind of the craggly, you know. He was fine. He he actually, I, I thought he was good. But uh, what the fuck am I getting at? I'm trying to do a political podcast here. Uh, they were so professional that they created an IMDb thing, which I'd never thought I'd have. <laughs> but so suddenly, I I think they emailed me. Because they were just like sending out emails to all the the, the cast and crew, or like, hey, so here's your IMDb that we made for it. I was like, whoa, cool! And I have so I, it might be different now. I don't know why it would be. Uh, I've done a couple things that probably should be on IMDb, but this one was definitely on there. I was the fourth Hank Thompson, <laughs> and my one role, my one credit on IMDb was bald villain. <laughs> it said bald villain. <laughs> it's like some cosmic mistake. Had just uh, you know placed me on there, but uh, anyway, I always thought that was entertaining. Way too much time wasted on talking about this. So, Stephen Miller is indeed a bald villain. Let's just listen to a little bit of him here. This is this story is really not about what he's saying. 
is about what he is, uh, how stupid he thinks we all are in relation to his baldness. But here's just his voice, or this is part of him on an interview on Face the Nation with um, I don't know, one of their hosts. Down in our country today is the loopholes in our immigration laws and the deficiencies in our immigration laws and left-wing activist judicial rulings that incentivize the most vulnerable populations to come to our country. Last year, and the administration 100, hasn't been 000, able to deter them last from year, making that trip. Last year, 100,000 unaccompanied alien children or children traveling with adults showed up at our southern border. So he's an asshole. He's a piece of shit. Last year, he's got the. He's from Santa Monica, by the way. Uh, one of his um, monikers, not that he goes by this, is the Santa Monica fascist. Because Santa Monica is kind of a place where a lot of money, a lot of old money, I think. Uh, it's right on the ocean. There's a Santa Monica Pier, the Third Street Promenade, which is a great place to go to um, see people have fun. Um, I, I've done some comedy down that way. <laughs> Not that it has anything to do with him. But uh, he's from California, and he grew up in this area. And he's was uh, there was, I recall, reports from classmates of his at the time. He's in his early 30s now or mid, mid-30s, mid I, I, I assume. He looks like he's in his uh, late 800s. But... Um, you know, classmates, you said he was like this horrible piece of shit guy. And there's some videos of him giving speeches as a, as a student. He, like right from the get go, this dude was uh, embracing the xenophobia and racism and uh, anti-immigrant fervor that is now he, he wields a lot of power. This guy has almost as much power as Fox and Friends. He has to, he, I mean, he, he works in the White House. <laughs> he goes to work. And the person in charge of the country, who happens to be Donald Trump somehow, um, listens to him and bases policies off of what this fucking guy says. So he's, he's, he's a real garbage human being. So he's been uh, being dragged through the mud, and that's what I'm doing right now, too, uh, over his decision on this Sunday talk show appearance to cover up his bald spot with that fiber spray there's like this fiber bald guy fixing stuff which would be a great name for bald product fiber bald guy fixing stuff (laughs) uh it's i've seen it once to uh, someone who used it and it's not paint it's like these weird fibers i don't know what they're made of i didn't want to touch it but it it's meant for as far as i understand it's meant for like thinning hair and you, it fills in your hair and kind of mixes in with your hair, I guess, and covers your head, your scalp, because a dead giveaway that you're bald is that you can see your scalp and in certain lighting conditions. And, you know, men deal with tremendous... Anyway, of course, this is an issue that affects women sometimes in their later years, but baldness, of course, primarily a male issue. Uh, and uh, it, it, it does provoke a lot of emotions, of insecurity, of denial. Is denial an emotion? I don't know if that, that more, I would count that more of like a, hmm, it's not really an emotion. It's more just sort of a, man, I don't know, a subtext? Not really that. It's sort of a, just a a condition, maybe. Uh, what is, okay, all right, sorry. Um, so unlike most people who use the fiber spray, as far as I know, this guy is like totally bald. He probably has some scraggly on the top, but he is really bald. And he's had, he's been highly public, meaning he's been uh, like in the national spotlight for over two years now. And so he goes on TV with what looks like a shadow of a B-1 bomber or like one of those big black, I think the Blackbird has, it sort of has a rounded cone and he left the large forehead corners as bald. But he just covered it up. And there's a shot of him from behind showing the horseshoe, the curve, uh, or which I like to tell ladies is a lipstick depository. Give it a peck, ladies. Uh, he left that bald. So I don't know if he did it himself because from the front, it looks like he has it like like someone dared him to wear a handful of chocolate sprinkles on his head. But it's covers the scalp meaning like it's thick enough you can't see skin below the sprayed on fiber mat but from behind bald is my balls before a date which means there's like one long one just hanging out going oh, you can't get me you fucking razor <laughs> how annoying is a shaving ball like, fellas fellas and ladies who are who are down for anything i mean my god 
It's like shaving an accordion. God, I'm so glad I didn't say xylophone. I get I always say xylophone when I mean accordion. So embarrassing at band practice. But um, so anyway, this fucking dude decides to uh, cover like how for, how insecure. Like, look, I get why people going bald. It sucks. I went bald. It started at age 19. People started commenting around age 20 ish, 21. Like it, it, for me, it happened really quickly. Like I didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. I don't know what causes it. I did. I did have a very bald grandpa on my mother's side. That's probably the primary source. I used to wear a lot of hats. Uh, I still do. Or actually, late like last year or so, I've been wearing a lot. Of hats. But um, I went bald quick, and I sort of and I was fat and depressed and kind of out of my mind anyway. Like I have been since I was a kid. <laughs> Although I didn't get fat until about seventh or uh, yeah, yeah, eighth grade maybe. But I was a skinny kid. But anyway, the, like first. I believe, and I will defend this position, that me being a balding teen, even though I was 19, I still snuck in under the, the technical threshold. It's not like, I didn't know a guy in high school was balding at like 16. It's like, whoa, dude, give it three years, man, come on. Um, but because I was a balding teen, I believe I have the right to comment on everybody's hair all the time, except minorities and women and um, so basically white assholes like this guy. I'll make funny. No, no. But dude's going bald. I have tons of jokes about being bald. I got all kinds of jokes about going. But anyway, I, I have a huge chunk about baldness. Cause I, 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 they're, I think they're decent bald jokes. But they're, um, you know, it's just, I, I never really developed them much. because. Well, I mean, that's not true. I developed them quite a bit. But I, I was shied away from doing them because it felt hacky to be the bald guy doing bald comedy. Even though I think my bald stuff is about the... Uh, kind of journey you go through and the emotions of it all. And, and it, it, I talk about like being um, younger guys who are going, or actually older guys have come to me too, but people, men who see me and they look at me and they see their future, but what they don't realize is they don't have a skull this beautiful. Like I'm starting to get in my actor. Um, so I have a beautiful skull, by the way, fucking perfect. Uh, what joke from my act is uh, my mom must have had the biggest cervix. See, see, this is kind of, this is, this explains why I didn't succeed. Succeed. Uh, so, but, once you once you're bald, you're bald. You're just fucking bald. Just go with it. And this guy, I mean, he's. I don't know why I'm bringing this up. I think it just points out how insecure these people are. There's not nothing wrong with being bald. Uh, actually, one of my bits is about how like we're, we're. I'm glad baldness is common enough that it's not considered freakish. Like if it was just a few percentage points less common, we'd be fighting for rights. We'd be having bald pride parades. We'd be having fighting for bald marriage. You know, shit like that. You, people on Fox News would be like, ah, oh, fuck you. You know, like that kind of, but, all right, you, you get that. You get the idea. That's one of, uh, what am I doing? How embarrassing. I hope nobody I know <laughs> listens to the, uh, um So uh, there's really nothing to say. But this dude is an insecure weirdo loser. Uh, use the spray. And, I'm, and any guys out there going bald and you're trying to do stuff to cover it or trying to, it, I, it's okay. It's okay. You're in the process. That's a phase. But this guy was way past this that phase where it's even close to okay because you try to comb it forward you try to comb it sideways you try to co you try to cover it you do the and it, one of the i think this is probably a universal truth about this uh, balding process is that there's that denial where it actually is much more obvious than you are telling yourself it is even if you acknowledge it's obvious it's still more obvious than you think is strong um and you always there's those photos where you just go oh man i can't believe i thought that was covering it up jesus like i didn't do much i, I did used to kind of keep the hair at the front longer just because i i kept because your head slopes down at, at the top uh, above the eyebrows you know whatever the front of it's called the uh you know where the cortex that's the whole okay um the frontal lobe and so i kept the top a little but it's i wasn't trying to cover it ever i never I, it happened so quick for me. Uh, and worst part is, I, when I did have hair, I just had a dorky haircut. I didn't even have a cool haircut. I, did, I had a side spike. No, I, I, that's not true. I did actually, I think in like sixth grade, I don't know, you know, when my mom was calling the shots or at least, you know, presenting the options to uh, her children. Oh, yeah, do, just do that. I'm old. I'm old. Side spikes were cool in the early 90s. Fortunately, I had a snap bracelet uh, accident that nearly took my head off, and we gave up that bullshit. So, fuck Stephen Miller, fuck Donald Trump, his uh, beliefs and and uh, on, on on immigration and everything else is far worse than his attempt to uh, cover his giant bald head 
from where the evil radio waves emerge that he uses to bamboozle people. I don't know how anybody listens to these fuckheads and thinks that, like, yeah, that guy's saying some... He's really coming across as a good faith, honest operator here. Let's listen to a little more of this fuck face. Mm -hmm. President Trump took dramatic action, issued an executive order directing illegal traffic to the ports of entry. But a left wing. Oh, he issued an executive order to the people outside the country with, if they're lucky, bags of garbage and strollers to help with their bringing their children across thousands of miles of Central America and, and, uh, and Mexico. So, screw these people. I hope he sprays that shit in his eyes. It's nasty. What is it like when you rinse it off? You know? Like, you ever rinse off a, like a muddy basketball? I bet it's like that. It just kind of flakes off from kind of big chunks. Ugh. Weird. Weird little fibers. It gets on your hand. It starts to itch. Is it itchy? I've never done the fiber thing. Maybe I should start. I would do it if they had Chewbacca fibers. If I could get, like, a spray can, but it was just, like, is silly string. <laughs> like, you get, like, 18-inch long strands, and they just you, you stick them to your head. Like glue in the end of a rope to a wall. Turns out, not how ropes work. They're meant to go around things, not glued the end to stuff. All right, enough of that. It's kind of like shaving a bald horse. Am I right? Am I right? Um, so welcome. Uh, Jesus, welcome. What the fuck? We're in the middle of the show. Um, next story is these. Uh, this has been in the news the last day or so. Is uh, Donald Trump has is in the process or has at least committed to it to dissolving, dissol- dissolving, dissolving. Dissolving, yeah, you got to say the S is the double S is the Z. The dissolving of his charity, the Trump Foundation. Now, this this charity is vitally important. I don't know how we're going to get by without it. Uh, you know, as George Bush once said, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, I'm a dumb mother. I'm a fucking idiot. My my whole family's a a, a blight on this culture and this nation. <laughs> Um, I did do John Stewart's version of that. But uh, George Bush once talked about how, um, you know, we don't need government to do things for people. We've got charities to fill in. They will t- pick up the slack where it's in. That's what it's for. That's what churches and, and, and charities. Well, fuck off. That's not the way it works. So anyway, Trump's charity, totally legit, of course. W- what else could it be? Uh, they famously uh, stole money from kids with cancer. <laughs> the, uh, there's the story... So the story there, and I don't have the entire thing in front of me here, but I I did find an article on Forbes detailing some of it uh, regarding Eric Trump. He's the uh, the the one of Trump's sons who looks like um, like if vampires were assholes. Uh, He um, he's he's just a piece of crap. He's tall, which makes him even worse. Um, I don't know how tall he is, but uh, taller than Don Jr. of course, which I hope disappoints uh, his uh, father. These fucking people. I hate talking to him. Okay. All right. So anyway, so Eric Trump um, was bragging. They, they, you know, the Trump Foundation, Trump organ. I don't know if it's called the organization or the Trump Foundation. I think it's called Foundation. Organization is the name of his business or something. He's got tons of them though, um, meaning differently, you know, incorporated entities. But uh, this charity has been used for scams for a long time. Just as it's been described as a personal piggy bank for these guys. But the uh, cancer kids thing was, uh, I'm just reading from this article. Um, Additionally, the Donald J. Trump Foundation, which has come under previous scrutiny for self-dealing and advancing the interests of its namesake rather than those of charity, apparently used the Eric Trump Foundation to funnel $100,000 in donations into revenue for the Trump Organization. And while donors to the Eric Trump Foundation were told their money was going to help sick kids, more than 500000 was redonated to other charities, many of which were connected to Trump family members or interests, including at least four groups that subsequently paid to hold golf tournaments at Trump courses. And there was some uh, uh, details in this article about how he lied about the expenses being used, uh, that they get their expenses for free for the because they're using Trump facilities, and which wasn't true at all. And there's all this sort of scammy bullshit. You're supposed to follow specific rules when you run a charity. It, it's important that you follow the rules, too. Now, the Eric... Trump Foundation, uh, as well as the Donald J. Trump Foundation, I uh, I don't necessarily distinguish. I mean, these people are all kind of like a multi-headed hydra of a of a corrupt family. Uh, well, by the way, what a bunch of morons! Why would you run for president? Like I I, I tweeted this a few weeks back about just like this guy Trump. 
Donny Donny Senior was a lifelong criminal. First one, his dad forced him to be one at age three by using his son's uh, existence as a tax dump, tax avoidance dump. But he became a criminal and, and, and an enthusiastic one, mobbed up, money laundering, shady deals, using the court system, which is technically not illegal. But like, you know, for him not paying and then just being sued by people to try to collect payments was just part of how he did business. You got, you know, he, he, you wound up, your choice was to do a bunch of work for him. And then sue him to get one third of the payment or not sue him and save a bunch of money, but still get screwed out of all the expenses and work that you've done. And so uh, ongoing. And we're in the process of learning a lot of this. Uh, Use this 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 this, uh, charity to uh, conduct a lot of this shenanigans, a lot of these shenanigans. Uh, Maybe we should clamp down on this stuff a little more here in America. Honestly, I think that, uh, you know, white collar crime and people who, um, you know, rich people who have money, who have political connections, who have resources, who run businesses. Not that running a business isn't any, is in any way an indicator that you're a criminal, but people, we, we don't have anywhere near the kind of enforcement that we should have for white collar crime. Uh, hopefully that changes if we get a progressive administration in and we start to, you know, people are being kind of snapped out of their complacency by how terrible this whole Trump situation is. So uh, this is a good example of why we would need more. Uh, regulation. So now uh, going to a Bloomberg article, I'm just going to pick a couple paragraphs out of this. Um, as you might know, by the way, uh, the Trump Foundation is currently being um, investigated by the New York Attorney General named Barbara Underwood. It was started by the that dude, what's his name? He had to re- resign in horrible scandal. He was a real monster to women. So good riddance, but luckily the uh, investigation, he uh, Eric, was that, what's that guy's name? Damn it. Schneiderman? Eric Schneiderman, I think. Um, I, the investigation continues under Barbara Underwood. And um, so here's a piece from the article. Uh, Barbara Underwood, the New York State Attorney General, announced on Tuesday that her office and the foundation signed a stipulation agreeing to dissolve Donald, dissolve Donald Trump's longstanding but chronically underfunded gesture toward charitable giving. Trump launched his foundation in 1988 as a vehicle, he claimed, for distributing profits from his bestseller, The Art of the Deal which he never read and can't write, uh, to needy causes. But the foundation was housed at his company, the Trump Organization, and had no dedicated office or staff or office space. Here's a, I believe this is Barbara speaking. Our petition detailed a shocking pattern of illegality involving the Trump Foundation, including unlawful coordination with the Trump presidential campaign, repeated and willful self-dealing, and much more. Underwood noted, this amounted to the Trump Foundation functioning as little more than a checkbook to serve Mr. Trump's business and political interests. That was Underwood speaking again. While the Trump Foundation evaporates, Underwood's office said, the Attorney General's lawsuit against the organization will proceed. Like, did he think this was going to end it? No, nothing to see here. I'm done. It's not a thing. It's over. I'm gesturing during this impression. It actually helps sell the impression a little bit. The lawsuit seeks millions in restitution and hold still. Let me finish. Let me finish. Hold, just hold still till I'm done. <sighs> you know, he's breathing is audible. Fucking gross. The lawsuit seeks millions in restitution and penalties and a bar on Trump and his three eldest children, Donald Jr., Ivanka, and Eric, who all served on the foundation's board from serving on the board. I, I hope Barron, I'm not going to cry about Barron, but, you know, because leave him out of it. But he's going to eventually turn into a, an adult and f- deal with all this stuff what a that's another weird pov everybody in this whole world not just the trump family but every almost every single person involved on the media side on the republic uh, on the politics side on the republicans and the large uh, many on the democrats i mean just all these different people could be like they could make movies about every single one of them different foreign interests that are involved uh, i mean it's 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 very dramatic like there's a lot of rich veins of stories being generated here I'll, even if they're all largely you know coming from mordor but still mordor dramatic place right uh how the hell did I, oh yeah so oh baron is eventually just i'm just curious what that pov is like as he starts you know this because by the time he's 18 19 20 uh hopefully he's healthy and not what befalls most uh children not maybe i shouldn't say most but you know the the less you have to, well, uh, I wasn't going to say work, but, um, you know, generally people who are descended from wealthy, there's a pretty decent 
chance uh, of them, you know, of their privilege and their entitlement and their wealth, po- you know, rotting their heads and just them turning into, uh, you know, wackadoodles. Not like sophisticated upstarts like Wyatt Coke, who you should Google. Google Wyatt Coke shirts and you'll have a great time. All right. Get your girlfriend or your boyfriend over and do it. And then you'll get so aroused by the uh, by the obvious raw power of that guy, and you will have the best sex of your life. Wyatt Coke, aphrodisiac to everybody. Um, so the uh, but and just Baron, I just is going to sort all this out. He'll probably have a bunch of money, and um, I just hope he buys himself the Xboxes that he needs to feel better about it all. You know, uh, so. Continuing with the article, under the terms of the stipulation, this is in Bloomberg, by the way, under the terms of the stipulation, the Trump Foundation's dissolution requires judicial supervision and its rena- remaining charitable assets, about $1.7 million, have to be distributed to reputable organizations, that's in quotes, that the Attorney General's office approves. It expects to receive a list of those organizations within 30 days. So what, like, it's going to be like Trump, Donald, it's, it's going to be a sheet of paper with uh, Donald Trump's left pocket and Donald Trump's right pocket. And they're going to say, okay, fine. All right, this is America. Everything's fucked up and stupid here. So, yeah, of course, just steal it. Just steal it, you piece of shit. The Attorney General said the stipulation doesn't prevent third parties that may still feel aggrieved or defrauded by the Trump Foundation from seeking redress. Okay, good. So here's some of the details. There, You know, this is sort of just kind of pinging different, um, you know, ways that this charity was abused and illegally used. Trump had given about $5.5 million to his foundation through 2015. His last gift was 35000 in 2008. Outside donors, although I, I highly question the source of any money Trump gave to this, uh, many of which did business with the president, have given the foundation about $9.3 million. The biggest donors to the foundation were Vince and Linda McMahon, co-founders of World Wrestling Entertainment. You know that guy, the, him and Linda. How insane is it that the World Wrestling guy, and especially his wife, she's, she's like a... She's a are they ambassador or something? They have a big, uh, they've been a, oh yeah, she employed, she was, okay, here we go. God, I sound so stupid. Uh, I am, not just sound, but uh, who kicked in five million. So the, the, the McMahons gave five million, all that super rope money they got from selling their, their uh, people, you know, temporary tattoos and diabetes. After becoming president, Trump appointed Linda McMahon to run the small business, <laughs> she's in charge of the small business administration. They're billionaires. There's so much abuse with the Small Business Administration. I'm not going to get into it now because I'm ignorant about it. But I, uh, the SBA, um, there's all sorts of ways companies pretend to be small in order to get loans and stuff. And it's written. The rules are written specifically for those loopholes, and it, 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 it's absurd. And that's not just. I'm not saying that's Trump's fault. That's just American corruption 101. But anyway, so the Trumps have said that the foundation has donated more money than it received, about $19 million. But a full accounting of where all that money went may stretch the definition of charitable. And by the tone of my voice, I'm doing inverted commas, which is what the British call air quotes. Because the British have weird words, which does not deserve air quotes. Uh, Underwood's lawsuit is a stark reminder of how flagrantly... Illicit, the Trump Foundation has been. This is an opinion piece, I want to say, but it's giving me a lot of information. Uh, it alleges a pattern of persistent illegal conduct occurring over more than a decade that includes extensive unlawful political coordination with the Trump presidential campaign, repeated and willful self-dealing transactions to benefit Mr. Trump's personal and business interests, and violations of basic legal obligations for nonprofit foundations. Underwood, uh, wait a minute, I'm just reading this. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, here, as my Bloomberg opinion colleague Francis Wilkinson has observed, uh, let's see, who's the writer? Just, we're giving credit. Someone's not even written this. Timothy O'Brien. The L. He's Timothy L. O'Brien. I assume that stands for L. Bean. Back to the thing. As my Bloomberg opinion colleague Francis Wilkinson has observed, the Trump Foundation's single largest gift, $264,631, was allotted toward renovating a fountain. Outside the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan, Trump owned that the hotel. <laughs> so they spent they spent a quarter million fixing the fountain outside his business. Oh, that's nice. That's the kind of charity that that helps uh, people stay warm and uh, to, you know help people who really need it and who are down on their luck and need a little uh, little boost. Just they have a little fountain that they can go swim around in if it's not already filled with cheese whiz because Donald Trump dipped his head in in it. 
Cause, and all the cheese was poured out of his disgusting ears. How gross are his ears? How gross are ears in general? These holes that produce wax. I think they're magical. I think it's pretty cool that they work. That they are these foldy, flappy things. Like we think bats look goofy with their ears. Look at us. Even the chimps and gorillas have sensible ears. Theirs don't poke out like ours. These little flappy, weird things. Our, our ears are so crazy, we can make necklaces out of them. That's outrageous. Underwood's lawsuit also points out that Trump used foundation money to pay off legal obligations, promote his hotels and other businesses, and purchase goodies for himself. Like a tin of popcorn. I made that up. But, you know, the ones with the three types, and then you pull out the cardboard, and you stir it up, and, you, and then your brother yells at you because you're like, well, that, that, uh, it tastes good when the caramel and the cheese are in the same handful. Yeah, I know the, the butter is in there, too, but that's fine. It's salty. Nobody likes just the regular old white-ass popcorn. It's disgusting. That list includes a $100,000 payment to settle legal claims against Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort. <laughs> so they, they use charity money to pay a, a lawsuit payout. <laughs> $158,000 payment to settle claims against the Trump National Golf Club. They were sued. They lost. Oh, I know where we got a pile of money. People gave it to us for charity. We used it to settle a legal dispute that we lost. From a 2008 lawsuit involving that course's hole-in-one tournament. <laughs> Right there. What the hell happened with that? And a $10,000 payment to a charity auction to purchase a painting of Trump that was displayed at the Trump National Doral in Miami. Because true charity is using money intended for you know the needy and the destitute and somebody who needs it to buy a painting of yourself and hang it in your business. <laughs> what, a, what a weirdo. Um so that's okay. As an auction to the national, okay. Reminder here, the seminal reporting, from, this is in parentheses, uh, from the Washington Post, David Fahrenholt, that uh, helped expose much of this as well as earlier work, dating back to 2011, from the smoking guns, William Bastone. Hey, thanks, Bill and David. At Trump's direction, Underwood's lawsuit also alleges the Trump Foundation illegally provided extensive support, that's in quotes, to Trump's 2016 presidential campaign, notably five $100,000 grants prior to the Iowa nominating caucuses. So when he became the nominee, there was a bunch of stuff, and I'm not sure this is related to the charity, but I know like they were using an office in Trump Tower and charging some really low rate because it was his money being spent mostly at the time. At least that's what we're told. Now, they were spending charity money <laughs> as well, so what, they weren't really using their own money. I mean, if anything Trump is famous for, it's his love of debt, which basically means spending someone else's money uh, although that is a complicated topic, we get into the personal debt, and actually there's books written about it that I'd like to redo some research on because I think a lot of debt should be canceled. We should just, what do they call that, a rumspringer? No, that's not the word I know. But uh, there's some word, a jamboree, is that right? There's like a word for it where it's like, okay, we'll just fucking stop with the debt and never give everybody a break. And then, you know, everything's good then. <laughs> I think they used to do that. Whatever, I, I'm, I know I sound stupid. Oh, oh yeah, so the, when he became the nominee... And money started to flow. I mean, a lot of money gets poured into this these coffers. He, he, he continued the bullshit that he was using his own money, which, like I said, maybe at the beginning, even that I'm dubious on, but certainly after he became the obvious front runner and then the nominee, he wouldn't spend his own money. But then they raised the prices on the office rent because that's more money for these Trump scammers. <laughs> these people are such fucking petty little criminals. And that's what I was saying earlier. They opted in to this scrutiny. That's how fucking stupid these people are. Lifelong criminal. Lifelong. But he's gotten... And, and, and isn't that a great example of how warping white privilege is, wealth privilege is? He got away with it. I mean, I don't think this guy is a good example. He's not your standard human. He's an outlier. Most people don't have this overwhelming narcissistic condition he's got. Many do. But it's nowhere near, I mean, you know, it's not, his is a kind of uh, re uh, incredibly distorted version of it. And he wouldn't be any anywhere near the presidency if he wasn't born with a dick and with white skin. Nowhere fucking close. And with a lot of money. And with tons of money. That definitely wouldn't happen. Um, I know that this past weekend SNL did some shit about, I don't know, I, every time I see anything, even even the good stuff SNL does, I just, my eyes glaze over. And I just want to become a Krispy Kreme donut. It's a glazed donut. 
that's not okay. Um, but uh, the uh, Tony or Anthony Ant- Atimachuk or whatever, that guy that, uh, who plays Trump in the president's show on Comedy Central, they did a thing. I think that's what it's called. I never actually watched that show, but I've seen clips of that dude. He's so good. He's the guy that does the he's just excellent Trump impression. Um, and it's just they capture his essence and his desperation and the constant masking of his insecurity with his weird BSing confidence that somehow people fall for. I don't know how people fall for that. I am so suspicious of confidence and certainty in anybody, even when it's earned. Even then I'm like, mm, okay, I'm watching you. I know you know what you're talking about, but uh, but if you definitely don't know what you're talking about and you're confident, fuck off. That's probably how we describe my whole podcast, by the way. So they, they did a thing about how if Trump had been born, not Trump, he just was this guy. And, you know, it's funny. And he runs around being just like a petty scammer who, uh, you know, just a street, street hustling loser, which is probably accurate. All right, a little more. Fuck it. Let's keep going. The suit says that Underwood's office discovered that the Trump Foundation raised more than $2.8 million that it used for the 2016 election, including donations Trump raised at a nationally televised event featuring military veterans that he held on January 28, 2016. <laughs> Democrats lost to this guy. They lost to this guy who uses military events and veterans as, man, I can't believe the fucking, as an alternative to his participation in a presidential primary debate held in Iowa. I hope that sentence, uh, you were able to connect it. In violation, this is quotes. In violation of state and federal law, senior Trump campaign staff, including campaign manager Corey Lewandowski, dictated the timing, amounts, and recipients of grants by the foundation to nonprofits, as evidenced by communications between campaign staff and foundation representatives. The attorney general office pointed out. Okay, that wasn't worth reading. Uh, so there's more. There's it, it just on and on and on. But they're they're dissolving it. Um, but just because you get rid of the organization doesn't mean that you didn't the crimes you committed didn't happen. Or the alleged crimes. So hopefully they get him. Go after this fucking guy. And he deserves it. The president of a country should not be, uh, should have a good record. What kind of standard are the rest of us held to? How many lives are ruined because you had a DUI and you're a kid, especially if you're a minority, or you got arrested with a small amount of drugs, or you maybe you, you committed a crime? Even, you know, theft and stuff like that. That can lead down you know, lead people into these into these justice system catacombs that they never escape from. Even if they do kind of pull away from it, it, it dogs them for the rest of their life in terms of not being able to vote if they're a felon. Or, but also not, just having difficulty being, uh, ingra- not ingratiating, uh, integrating in a society and getting a job and all these other ways that people suffer. Obama, had he been uh, arrested for drugs, he admitted to doing coke and weed. It was fine. No problem. I, I I'd, honestly, I'd be suspicious of a president who's never had pot. Coke, okay, I'm not going to make that a requirement, but all right, that's fine too. I don't give a shit. Uh, it's nice that he admitted it, but had he been arrested for those when he was a young man, he would have been president. It would have definitely, you know, challenged his uh, his future prospects to become a senator and a respected guy. So people pay enormous consequences for small crimes. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but it, it pisses me off that these large crimes that these higher ups perpetrate, th- it doesn't seem to really come down on them. So good. Hopefully this does. Uh, Trump is under, I think I've heard 17 separate investigations by different entities. Um, I wonder, <laughs> nice word, how much of that would have happened had he not run for president. And you might make the case that, hey, that's not fair. How come just because he does that, he gets uh, exposed? It's not wrong. It's, politi- it's politicizing this guy. Right. Yeah. Because he has a lot of power. And he's using it like a maniac, even if he weren't. He should be investigated for all this stuff. He represents a country, an extremely large, powerful country. And it should be investigated whether he were pre- what became president or not. That's what I was saying earlier. We need a lot more of this. One of the things Bush did, I recall from like it was like the first weeks of his presidency, um, was immediately cut the funding for IRS enforcement. This has actually been in the news a little bit lately uh, regarding something very similar. Uh, just some stats about I don't have them in front of me, but just some stats about how the IRS is very under understaffed 
uh, intentionally, and especially particularly in the areas where uh, they investigate higher profile, higher net worth individuals. And Bush did that immediately. That was one of the things he did right away so that they don't go after their buddies, their donors. I mean, this is what the corruption is. This is the churn. This is the grift. This is how it all works. The rich look out, look out for each other. I, I scratch your back. You make sure I get elected. You scratch my back. I make sure that you don't have to spend X amount of money polluting that river so that you can claim uh, that your company met its quarterly profits for this year and therefore you get your bonus. And then boom, you go, oh, look, we both are uh, go to the same uh, hotels. I mean, like uh, gathering spots. We're both part of the same social scene, these fundraising things and, and uh, you know, donating to uh, supporting the same think tanks and all these other lobbying organizations and all the different ways that corruption is uh, uh, built into our system. And, uh, gee, isn't that, isn't that convenient that we're all in this together? It's not smoke-filled rooms. It's just how the system works. And, by the way, I would like to just plug my good friend Joe Rogan <laughs> um, had a guest on Lawrence Lessig, who I've known – a while, not, not, I don't know him. You know, he won't, he won't, he won't return my texts. We had one awkward date, and it was like, dude, it's not my fault. The, there was no sunset. I don't control the clouds. Get out of here. Soft hands. No, no, no. But Lawrence Lessig is really. He's, I think he's a Harvard professor. I might be confusing him with Lawrence Tribe or something. Anyway, anyway. So, but uh, he's been working in the in the um, corruption, exposing corruption game for a long time, and he's a very articulate, smart, well researched, well regarded guy and uh, it's, I'm really glad he was on Joe Rogan because Joe Rogan's audience needs to hear that stuff uh, Joe Rogan does tend to be a bit of a conduit for the alt-right uh, shit shitheads you know I mean like the intellectual dark web these fucking people these uh, you know Jordan Peterson and, and ben, ben Shapiro and all the everybody Dave, Dave Rubin and you know, these morons Barry Weiss and them you know something's fucked up when Joe Rogan's a smart one and that's all with love to my my guy Joe, I met him once at the Young Turks uh, several years back. Super nice, really good dude. Um, but uh, it, he does he he he's not as intellectually rigorous as his platform demands is what I guess is one way of saying that. But it's great that it, but he does seem to have an honest, authentic curiosity and is willing to listen. And maybe if that goes down some paths that aren't aren't stellar, okay. But he'll, he will have, like, uh, liberal people on, too. Kyle Kalinske's been on a show. Um, I'd hope to see. Cenk Uger's done it, although it's been a, quite a while. He should go back on, I think. Uh, there's a lot of people he could be having on. And, and I'm not even saying, well, I guess I am a little bit, but to sort of balance out the right-wing push that he has. And so, But Lawrence Lessig is, is as legit as it gets. And if you're curious to listen, he, the, the, the whole episode is great. Um, and they just mostly it's Lawrence Lessig talking. Uh, Joe asking questions and it's uh, really in, in, informative. Also, just sort of, you know, Joe is a. I mean, every host of every show is sort of a conduit for their audience. Uh, maybe not. It's kind of avatar mm, embodiment. I mean, you're kind of a stand a surrogate. And that might be the word I'm looking for. And Joe's astonishment at how systemic and deeply embedded. I want to say endemic. I'm not sure if that's but uh, this corruption is. And uh, Lawrence Lessig does a great way of explaining. He, he explains the, um, I liked his analogy of Lester's. So he goes on about, he starts describing this as uh, our country is basically run for the Lester's. And he chose that name because it's roughly the amount of people who max out their donations to politicians. And that's around 150, I think he said 150,000 people are named Lester. <laughs> so that's a good a way of sort of explaining the all the policy apparatus and intention of the U.S. government is directed towards benefiting these 150,000 people, those who can afford to pay the politicians. And there's a subgroup of that that is much more, they, they get like 60% of the benefits or something like that, which are the very, very, very wealthy, the, the billionaires. And those are the people that I'm always railing about, uh, the Bezoses. Is, uh, and the, the, the Koch brothers and the, everybody else, all billionaires. I, I don't give a fuck if you're a liberal billionaire. You're still a monstrosity and an obscenity on humanity. So uh, I would hope that by the end of my life, hopefully it's another 40 years or so or whatever, um, that as long as there's still internet. I mean, once the apocalypse hit, actually I'm kind of looking forward to the apocalypse because I'm good at starting fires. I don't mean like arson fires. Like I'm good at building 
you gotta get air under there. You know, it's, you can do you can do like a log house. You can do a teepee. Boom, boom, boom. Do both. You know, throw. You know, um, but those are the. I uh, see. I just totally lost track of what the fuck I was saying. Anyway, you get the idea. Listen to that episode. It's good, uh, and uh, lots of good stuff out there. So um, we were gonna do the Chuck and Nancy stuff. Uh, it's eight thirty p.m. here on Tuesday night. Sorry, I'm a day late. By the way, I meant to say this at the top. I just had. I just didn't get it done on Monday night. I just was tired. <laughs> We're fucking working. I mean, I should do it on the weekends, but working, man, it's really gets in the way. <laughs> not, I'm not complaining. I'm explaining. Uh, so I'll take this over that. But um, yeah, I just couldn't. I had, you know, just didn't do it on Monday. So, but coming up soon, maybe some podcasting news out of the Young Turks eventually. I'm not, uh, uh, this is all not, not even, don't even take it as if I'm like, speaking about it's just me meaning like it's all you know what i mean like I, I i have some ideas for some podcasting stuff i'd like to give a go and maybe i'm in the right position to do it but uh so more on that as it develops i probably shouldn't be putting it out there i don't know why it's probably never gonna i, I mean no well, who knows we'll see we'll see it's uh you know could be good might be fun be, i think it'd be a lot of fun actually i okay you'll hear more about it as it comes up so, uh, yeah, we're going to end it. I'm going to go uh, put some food in my uh, the top of my poop hole and going to enjoy the rest of my night and get to the editing part of this whole thing, too. Although I'll probably do it in the morning. But uh, just big big thanks to you all for uh, being listeners, for listening. If anybody uh, new, still listening, thanks for listening to give me a chance. I told you the weird. it's weird, the solo ones. Um, these are so much easier and more fun when there's someone else. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, all right, it's good. It's, it, it, it's nice to be able to do the solo stuff uh, as well. So find me on Twitter. Find the show on Twitter, Winner Loser Show, at Winner Loser Show. It's sort of just a feed I'm using to just kind of list all the episodes and, and put links to um, me. <laughs> like if I'm on, like I, I put Happy Half Hour links if you, could check, if you want to check some of that out. And uh, at Hank underscore Thompson on Twitter, at Brett Ehrlich on Twitter. That's my other Twitter account. And go, uh, go, uh, you know, get out there and get it done. Okay. Get your holiday. Hope you're having a good holiday. You know, New Year's and all this other shit. It's all happening. Um, oh, here's a joke I wanted to say. I'm just, just deciding I'm just going to fucking ruin it and make it awkward here real quick. I, I actually wrote this down. It's, uh, wanted to start the show like this, but I didn't, I forgot to. So here it goes. Here it goes. Hey, Merry Christmas. Or as I like to call it. Mary Anderson Cooper New Year's Eve Live Eve. Oh, God. That went way better than I expected. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I love you. Uh, you know, even if you're lonely on Christmas, so am I. I'm lonely in July, too. So go fuck yourself. <laughs> oh, no, no. Everything sucks, right? Uh, no, it doesn't. I'm actually... I'm, before we go, let's just check in with the fellas. How you doing, Lindsay? I feel used and abused. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. How about you, Mr. Trump? Yeah, uh, been there, done that. What about you, Mr. Brett Kavanaugh? I always have had a weak stomach. Oh, poor baby. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. And, and, and what about you, Mr. Brett Ehrlich? Thanks for not giving as much of a shit about this one. <laughs> I just realized how much it must seem like I'm obsessed with them. I'm not. Uh, we sit across from each other at work and occasionally our toes touch. And if it happens one more time, I become his second husband. So, I mean, his first, second spouse. First husband. First would be, okay, why am I involving that poor guy? He's just been nothing but nice and sweet to me. Uh, good night, everybody. See you again. I mean, see you, see you tomorrow. Bye.